almost everyone who ever lived was wretchedly poor. We had roughly similar rates of uh, death of children, of starvation. It was the same, there was a little bit of a gap, but there wasn't much of a gap. What humanity satellite started to change with the Industrial Revolution, beginning around 1750. Even back then, it was knowledge that started making the gap appear. The gap in the take-up of the inventions and of the knowledge of the Industrial Revolution started making this huge gap. I, I, I'm not wearing the figures, so but something like a gap of maybe one to two, and now it's something like 20 to one and 30 to one. That means we're like 30 times better off than, than people in the poorer countries. And that started with the Industrial Revolution. And the reason I think it's super important to say that right now is that we've got another revolution that we are all benefiting from. We're right in this room, I mean, the information revolution. It's a game-changing event. It's hugely important. We're reaping the fruits of it, and they're not. We're moving further and further ahead because of the information revolution, and they're moving further and further behind. And I think that, that we are in a position to bring some of the fruits of the information revolution to Africa. I was looking for this quote, and Reinhardt kindly gave it to me and just in a conversation, and I think he's right. If knowledge means development, then lack of knowledge means lack of development. This is super important. So what can we do to help bring the information age to the countries that need it the most? I think we need to, to make three things happen, or three things need to happen, let's say. And I'd say step one is obviously content. They need knowledge. Well. What, what do they need and where are they going to get it from? So obviously we need content, we need open content. And when I started looking into this, I was amazed at how much content there is out there that's freely available, that is health, medical, educational, scientific, technical, the content that they need in the poor countries. And it's out there, it's an open source, and it's being gathered together every day. Only, only there's, a, there's a disconnect. The content's being gathered, but how is it getting to the people who need it? We still haven't solved that, and I don't really think it's up to us, but maybe I should stop you later in that point. But anyway. Okay, so there's there's open content alliances. There are libraries that are getting together to negotiate rights for electronic library collections to bring to the developing world. George Soros is involved with one or two open content alliances. There, um, there's all the information that the NGOs are putting on their websites. I'm not sure how they, they, what the content laws on governing that are, but if it's out on the web, it seems kind of open content. I mean, really important stuff. How to live with AIDS, how to rehydrate your child if, if he's got diarrhea. I mean, diarrhea is, in South Africa, the major cause of death of black children is diarrhea. I, I mean, the, the, we have the knowledge, but it's just not getting to the people who need it. Um, there's Google Books. Google is quietly going around and digitizing all the books that, that they can. Uh, Project Gutenberg has already digitized 25,000 out of copyright books. And I think people are even throwing their, just like musicians are sometimes giving their, their, their recordings to the net, making them freely available. I think people are starting to do that with books. There are something really interesting, there's Wiki Books. There's Wiki Junior, which has already digitized. Oops, I'm sorry. Which has already digitized, which has already created collaboratively, thirty-one thousand textbook pages. It just imagine if this information could be scalably translated and made available scalably to children in in the countries of Africa and uh, Southeast Asia where they're, they're not getting access to this kind of really superior educational content in their own language. The, um, the OECD has published studies saying that children learn a lot better in their own languages. We can say, well, hey, you know, they should learn French anyway, or they should learn English anyway. But the truth is, when they're struggling learning to learning math and basic concepts, what would be really good, at least for those first years, if we want them to have a good education and really compete with us um, and on an equal footing with us, then
they ought to have that in their own language because that's the way that they learn better rather than having to, to, to struggle to, with a whole new language and complex concepts. So, <coughs> and then there's Wikipedia, tremendous source of information. Um, I know that, that it's, it may not be perfect, but I, my 11 year old boy uses it all the time for his for studies, and he's learned a lot from Wikipedia. And um, Kirti Bashi from Asia Online made me aware of how you could look at Wikipedia, what's available on Wikipedia, as a reflection of what's available in different languages to people in different countries. And I started looking at, there's a page in Wikipedia where you can start looking at the languages, and there's some really shocking, shocking things there. So there's about 400 native speakers in English. There are 400 million, 350 to 400 million. We have two and a half billion pages on Wikipedia. We'll have more by the time we finish this session today. It's just an incredible amount of knowledge in English. We could look at a whole bunch of different languages, but I, I, just, I just got curious about a couple languages. So I skipped down to Punjabi the 11th most commonly spoken language in the world. There are 90 million speakers of Punjabi. But that's the language that 45% of the people in Pakistan speak natively. And 70% of the people in Pakistan understand. There are 393 pages in Punjabi and Wikipedia. And people can say, well, you know, if they came on the web, there'd be more pages for them. But I mean, would we go on the web if everything was in Ukrainian? I mean, I think it's a case of if you build it, they'll come. And in these are countries, if we look at Afghanistan, 42% of the people speak Pashto. There are like 1,200 pages on Wikipedia in their language. And 15% of the people in, in Pakistan as well speak that language. Um, so these are countries where they're just screaming out, I, I think, for more access to, to education. I won't get into the politics of it, but, you, but you, you've heard that argument that people there had so little access to education that they ended up in, in quite um, militant schools. Well, there's nothing on the web list, so there, there's no point in them even going there. Um, so I get so emotional. I get so emotional. Okay. Well, that's not so easy. But we've been talking about some really exciting and scalable technologies today. But we almost have to start, not start from scratch, but I think that we, we need to take on a really tall task is to help encourage language industries in Africa and parts of Asia where they need it. I mean, I think that that's a good place for us to start as an industry. If any of you are representing schools, and I know that some of you are, for example, you can make scholarships available to students from the poor countries. We can have a lot more educational content. Um, we can have courses that would take you a third. Oops. Oh, I don't have the nice picture because I've got my pictures there. Um, we can have courses, that, uh, road shows that we take to the developing world. And, and help encourage a translation industry. You know, there are a lot of translators, academics, um, teachers, engineers, journalists. And journalists make good translators in my experience because they're good writers. So I, mean, I think there's a lot that we could do as an industry to encourage a translation industry, because that's got to happen. Um, and I'm going to add crowdsourcing to this because the power of the crowd is just incredible. How much we can get done. I mean, we saw with Facebook, it translated in French in one day. I, it, you know, the power of the crowd. This is kind of an aside, but I, I just thought it was so interesting of what the crowd can do. We were talking about how Project Gutenberg and 